All right, welcome everybody. Um, awesome mood so far. So I'd like to ask a question, a show of hands. How many people here have heard of Big Blue Button? Okay, and keep your hands in the air. How many people use Big Blue Button? Awesome, all right. So uh, brief introduction, hi, I'm Fred. So I'm the co-founder of Big Blue Button Inc. I've been managing the Big Blue Button project since 2007, which is like 14 years or so. Uh, I also moonlight as the CEO of Blindside Networks. We're one of the sponsors, and we're out there on the hall. And for those of you that ever use Big Blue Button, I'm all with inside of Moodle. Uh, there's three people: uh, Jesus, Jesus Verduco, uh, Shimiso Javarza, and Laurent David, who are here at the conference, and they are the ones who have built the plugin for you. So if you see them in the hallway, just shake their hands, give them thanks. All right. So there are two company or two brands here associated. So Blindside Networks, we started the project in 2007. Uh, in the last two years, has been insane. Uh, we've hosted over 25 million minutes of virtual classes for over a million educators. And Big Blue Button, of course, it's an open source virtual classroom built by educators for educators. And I'll expand on that. And the hint is we're not a video conferencing system. All right, open source is super important to our project. So I'd actually riffed off of what Martin put in terms of the importance of open source. So uh, we've open sourced Big Blue Button. It's amazing to see all the servers around the world that have been, all the people around the world using Big Blue Button. And I'll give you three examples. We listen to educators. We say that we're built by educators for educators. And I'll expand on that. And we also engage the developer community. So we have a community of over 150 developers worldwide lots of people in our mailing list, and I only speak one language, where we're localized into over 55 of them. And in terms of sustainable revenue model, uh, Blindside Networks has been at this for 14 years, and we have grown. Uh, I think we work with 29 of the Moodle partners here. So if you're looking for Big Blue Button and you work with the Moodle partner, ask them. They can probably help you out. Three examples. The first one is baden Wuttenberg. Uh, who is here from Germany? Okay, awesome. So Beta Wuttenberg, actually, uh, the state of Germany went live with Big Blue Button. They have 3,000 Moodle sites, and at their peak, using Big Blue Button, they were able to support 185,000 teachers and students. Each one of those we cared about. Each one of those we built Big Blue Button for. It was so great to see it. The second example, uh, the country of France. The French Ministry of Education it has deployed Big Blue Button as its state webinar system, and it is moving it through the school system. So again, just huge numbers, but that's the entire country. It's important to them not only that it was open source, but it was data, uh, student privacy and digital sovereignty, which is what you can get with open source as well. And the third, uh, this was working with Moodle US. We deployed Big Blue Button uh, on site at GovCloud One for the US Air Force. Very large deployment, again, running with inside their network uh, with Moodle Workplace. Okay, so let me give you a story in three parts. The past, present, and future. And the past was sort of when Thanos snapped his fingers and we kind of lost three years. But it opened up the world for, open so or for virtual classes. So 2000, this was what Blindside Networks went through. This is our own and hosting. So we were, we were down here. And then we got all the way up there. So in the space of about three or four months, we increased our hosting to 60 times in size. However, not all was great. For, in, for all the students that went online, for all the educators that went online, I think we could all agree that it wasn't the best experience. And I say that because of a few things. One is a lot of us had little training. Um, a lot of schools used video conferencing system, not virtual classrooms. And a lot of them cobbled together third-party tools, and they kind of struggled to access, um, to assess students' progress. So th this quote from the UNICEF, 463 million children worldwide were unable to access remote learning during COVID, that is just not acceptable, right? This is one of the sustainability development goals that we have to reach, is that every student should have access to a high-quality online learning experience. So why was the struggle? Well, this is kind of simplified, but it kind of captures the sense. Video is a component of an effective virtual class, but it's not the entire virtual class. 
So yes, we do video, but why did instructors struggle if they just had video, just video and screen sharing? So it's complex, but it actually boils down to there's three sort of overlapping needs. What are the needs of the educator and the student? What is learning theory, because this is an online course? And what does technology tell us? So we spent a lot of time working on this. So we basically took each of these three things and we broke it down into individual constituents. Um, pedagogy has been around for 100 years, so why would you not take that into account when you're building a virtual classroom? Um, a couple of things here, like in terms of how our brain works, social constructivism, which of course is what Moodle's built on, and then we learn in stages, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then the technology, what you can do, if you should be able to do in an online class, and then the needs of the educator and the student. So just, you've all seen this, it's Bloom's taxonomy. This is how our brain works. Like we go from remembering something all the way to creating it. We just, that's the way our brain works. So the virtual classroom should have an appreciation and understanding of this. If you look at this, there's actually kind of three groups of how Bloom's works. And if you stare at it long enough, you can see, well, the first ones are memorization, long-term to short-term. The next stage is kind of like applied learning. This is where the brain is rewiring and understanding something through application. And then with application and creativity, you can master it. So the real learning is kind of occurring at those higher stages. Okay. So the use cases for an educator and a student should be front and center when designing a virtual classroom. So in terms of like the millions of minutes we delivered, Recently, we've done probably over 20 focus groups, interacted with hundreds of, hundreds of educators and students, and we broke down this complexity of delivering an effective virtual class into sort of four foundations. I'm gonna walk them through, because this is where we're gonna get to the future. So as an instructor, you wanna be able to set up and manage your classroom for success. You wanna be able to establish relationships, which is presence and trust with and between your students, so students feel comfortable to apply themselves. For engagement, you want to effectively engage your students so you can activate their minds for learning. That's the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. This is in contrast to just sitting and watching a live presentation where you don't interact, you do nothing. And assessment. So the teacher, the educator, really wants to know how students are doing in their class, assess their performance, and give timely feedback. And the student, well, the student wants to be able to feel comfortable to participate effectively master new skills, and receive timely help in struggling. So that's it. If you can do those seven use cases, we argue that you can deliver an effective class. And by following those use cases, it guides us in terms of development of Big Blue Button. So we can provide the tool for delivering effective virtual classrooms. So what does this framework tell us about the role of the virtual class? Well. If you stare at it long enough, you'll see that the first two really support the third and the fourth. And it really comes down to engaging the students, like activating their minds for learning, that's the applied learning, and helping them when they struggle. So if I were to boil this down to a sentence, the role of an effective virtual class is to maximize the time for applied learning and feedback. Feedback tells the student that this teacher is aware of them, cares about them, and supports them. So let's take a look at this now in the context of what we're doing today and in the future. So the present. So I'll go through these. Many of you know Big Blue Button, but just to hit some of the points and where we have applied learning. So multi-user whiteboard, really happy with this one. The new capability is you as the instructor can turn on multi-user whiteboard, and the students can't see each other's pointers. This opens up capabilities where you could say, okay, point out to me where Spain is. Most people got it right. Um, shared notes is a great example, both in the main session and breakout rooms. Polling is built in. You don't have to use a third party tool. In fact, it's fairly intelligent that when you bring up a slide that has like a couple choices, it actually says, hey, I think you've got a poll question. Would you like to have one button to do a poll? And so what that means is if the instructor comes to the Big Blue Button session, uploads their slides, and they have things like, hey, there's a true-false, there will be a button there to do one button click true-false poll. 
Same thing here as another example. You don't have to type anything in. You just hit one button. You'll do an ABCD poll. Helping the instructor manage your class, save time, engage students. Uh, recently, we allowed you to have multiple responses back from your students. And of course, we have breakout rooms as well. Okay. Assessment. So you're teaching the class. You're halfway through it. You're probably wondering a couple questions about your students. So uh, I'll contrast this with a video conferencing system. If you ask your students to share video and you've got 30 students and 10 of them are not sharing video, they're invisible to you. So the instructor is asking, how do I assess the performance so far of my class, groups, or individuals? So what we did, looking at these use cases, it led us to saying, well, we have to provide the instructor live analytics during their virtual class so they can assess performance. And so what we did was we created what we call the learning analytics dashboard. It opens up in another window. I have a couple screenshots. But it gives you the ability to see the performance of who's in my class, who's participating, and who's learning based on responses to polls. So it, as an instructor, you have the ability to launch it. And here are some screenshots. So at first off, it'll tell you exactly how long each of your students have been in your class. It will also create an activity score based on their polling, raising hands, talking, chatting. And this, this is not the grade, but this is to tell you that if you're trying to engage your students, and some of them are just not doing anything, and this will make it visible to you. Our goal was that there would be no back of the classroom with the blue button. There would be no invisible students to you. You could see what was going on. You could respond to it. In terms of the polling, you don't have to remember the polls. If you're halfway through the class and you've done a couple of polls, the polls provide like formative assessment. You can see the results of all of them, and you can pick out is there a particular student or group of students that are not responding or you know, getting the questions wrong. Recently, we added the version we just released had a timeline view. So this means that if you're an instructor, you're halfway through your session, some students have raised their hands, you don't have to remember which slides they raised their hands on if you're trying to review the material. You could go to timeline view and you can see it. For every student, we've had this activity score. We now show you how it breaks down. It's a relative score. So if the average class, if the average uh, and the people in the class had uh, responded to like three polls, you would get a lower score if you hadn't uh, responded. Same thing with talking and chatting and so on. So it's, it shows you that if somebody is inactive, you can at least know that to take, a, uh, to take advantage of it or to respond to it. And we give you, as the instructor, the ability to download the data as well. All right, some cool things as well that we're working on. So how many here have heard of TL Draw? OK, uh, how many here have heard of Figma or Miro? Yeah, OK. So TL Draw is an awesome open source project for Whiteboard. It has all the capabilities that you'd expect in a modern Whiteboard platform. So we are building this into Big Blue Button. And this actually is being supported by the French Ministry of Education. We wanted like a world-class whiteboard in Big Blue Button. So we're working with this project. It's replacing the existing whiteboard. And you'll have all the capabilities, like moving things around, drawing, really nice writing. And this will come back. This will be in Big Blue Button in the fall. This also makes it possible for us to actually get content back from the breakout rooms as well. So going back to getting students to apply themselves in breakout rooms, which is one of the most effective way, they can write on the whiteboard, and that content that they write will come back in the main room that the instructor can then use to do how the students present. Today, Big Blue Button is built into Moodle. Uh, we worked on the integration for 10 years, and our goal was to make Big Blue Button look like part of Moodle that if you didn't have Big Blue Button in Moodle, something was missing. So now it feels really good because today we can say Big Blue Button looks like part of Moodle because it is part of Moodle. It is now in the core. And there was a lot of effort by the developers I mentioned earlier on to get there, but we wanted to have like a deep integration with Moodle. And that deep integration opens up more ways that we can improve the virtual classroom experience. 
Um, one of the ways you can do today is we have activity completion. So those analytics that I showed you for the live analytics dashboard, a portion of those go back into Moodle when the session's done. And if in Moodle you have set up activity completion, like mark this activity is completed when students have been present for more than 90 minutes, Moodle now knows about this. And he can mark, it acti mark an activity as completed for you. We also worked with uh, the team at the Moodle Academy. And what we did is we created a course on delivering effective virtual classrooms using Big Blue Button. Some of the material in terms of the use cases and the research that we did earlier I presented or showed here, that flowed into the development of the course. So if you go to this course, it doesn't just say, here's how to upload slides or that. It starts first from like, what should an effective virtual classroom do? And then how should it do it? And what should it provide you as the instructor? And then we show you how you can do that in Big Blue Button. So it's more pedagogy based. So if, you're, if you have instructors using Big Blue Button, you, you know, we can develop the platform, but we know that there's an important component of being adept or proficient at teaching online as well. We want to make that as easy as possible for teachers, but there's some techniques and there's some ways of approaching teaching online. Um, we, tried to, we covered that in that course. So it's free, it's about two and a half, three hours self-paced, and uh, if you complete it, you get a badge. So really, how good is that? Okay, the future. So uh, there's so much that we want to do. And then what we get feedback from so many educators, so many commercial companies, so many Moodle, um, Moodle sites all around the world. So I didn't want to go through 20 things, but I wanted to go through a few things that we're really thinking about for making virtual classes more effective for educators. Let's go back to this. All that research that we did, the seven use cases, how the brain works, what's possible in a virtual classroom, you, you can boil it down to, you know, maximize the time for applied learning and feedback. And to get that feedback, you need to be able to assess. And you want to be able to do it live during the class, right? That visibility that there's no back of the classroom. You have visibility to how students are doing. So there's a context here. It starts with Moodle. You go into the virtual class, and you return back to Moodle. Moodle knows about your students. Moodle knows where students are struggling. Right? There's been lots of work done and research done in terms of like trying to identify at-risk students. And uh, we looked at a lot of this, and some of it is like machine learning and we'll you know, do lots of analysis, but sometimes it's really basic. Like if a student hasn't submitted the last two assignments, there's a high correlation that they're not going to pass. So that information's in Moodle, but why should it stay in Moodle when you go into your virtual class? Shouldn't any information related to students who are at risk be visible to you inside your virtual class? So this example here would be, like, wouldn't it be great if you went in and you had 30 students and two of them had kind of like a little warning and then you looked at it and you said, hey, Moodle's telling you that it doesn't have these last two assignments. During your class, you may take some extra time to help those two students out. This, if this was today and I said to you, hey, we're going to remove this feature, you'd be like, why? Like, this is important for virtual class, but it doesn't exist today because, again, most people have been using, like, a video conferencing system that has no idea what's going on with the virtual classroom. Breakout rooms. Okay, so breakout rooms are, like, by far one of the most effective ways to get people to, uh, to apply themselves in active learning. And this goes right back to social constructivism as well. We learn by helping other people. So in a class, it doesn't have to be the entirely the teacher. The teacher getting students to go into breakout rooms, students are helping each other out. Of course, the student is trying to help someone in the breakout room has to think about, how do I communicate this you know, clearly? The student who's in the breakout room receiving the help is getting benefit, and students watching this are getting modeling behavior of teaching and learning. But the instructor, these shouldn't be dark to the instructor. The instructor should see what's going on in the breakout rooms. So what we want to do through something we call breakout vision is give them visibility in terms of what's going on. And if you see a breakout room that is low activity, go into that breakout room. Help them out. Help those, teacher, help those students out. So we want to give you visibility into what's going on so that you can take time and, and give feedback and help out students. 
This next one, I cannot wait to do this one. Whiteboard vision. So I'll give you the scenario. You're halfway through the class, and you want your students to work on something for 10 minutes. Again, applied learning. When you do that, let's say it's a, uh, a math problem, and you've got like three quick questions you want them to do. And in them doing that, they're going to be using the whiteboard, right? So all that work that we're doing to put in like a world-class whiteboard comes to fruition here. So imagine that you could see the whiteboard activity of 12 students. Big Blue Button knows which one's moving the most around. Uh, there's three questions for students to answer. Big Blue Button knows if the answer is correct or not. And it starts sorting it for you so that the students that appear to be struggling appear in the upper left. You click on them, and on the right-hand side, you go into a one-on-one -on -one session with the student where they see you, you see each other, they, you hear each other, and you're doing a shared whiteboard. And now you can help that student out in their time when they're struggling. It tells the student that the teacher is aware of me, cares about me, and helps me out. You do that for a couple students, and you come back. That is far more effective because you're there to help them out, and the students perceive far more value from the virtual class than just passively watching it. So whiteboard vision. And actually, I'll go back to that. The idea is that after that is done, the content would come back into Moodle. So either the, the assessment of it or the, uh, the scoring of it, like we want to get that data back into Moodle. Looking ahead, there's a couple other things we want to do. So you might have picked it up. Martin, Martin mentioned Matrix yesterday. So it's a, it's a decentralized collaborative environment. Moodle will get, Matrix will get into Moodle at some point. And what that means is that we want to be able to support Moodle as, or Matrix as well, that if you have a discussion in your class and you move into the virtual classroom, that discussion could move with you. It's just a Matrix channel. So you have this concept of a continuous learning environment where the, the asynchronous and the synchronous now start to become more closer, more merged. And again, students can pick up what they may be discussed in, their, in the class, they can discuss it inside the virtual classroom. And then, of course, that discussion is back in the main classroom. We want to look at creating a plugin architecture, and this is just going to allow us to accelerate, build up on top of our open source community where other people can contribute to Big Blue Button. Right now, if you want improvements, they go into the core, but if we can create a plugin architecture, other people around the world could use us even more as a platform to build a better virtual classroom. And I I've talked about it a couple times, but I'm really looking for ways that we can get more data back into Moodle, and then through Moodle, we can generate unified reports. I want you to be able to, as an instructor or an educator, go into Moodle and see a report that says, here's performance of my students inside of Moodle, and here's performance inside of the virtual class, and have them come together. One report, one unified report. Of course, giving the instructor visibility and performance, and maybe finding those students that are outliers that need some help. Okay, to summarize, video conferencing uh, is not a virtual classroom. It is not purpose fit, as we believe. In going through the analysis of what we look at the foundations, how the brain works, how the technology should help the teacher, we believe that you can, you, teachers could and should have a better tool for doing virtual classes. We achieve that by focusing on the needs of the teacher and student. It's not a business collaboration it's a virtual classroom. And by doing that, we can achieve a deep understanding of what the teachers and students are trying to do in the virtual class, and then use that to guide our development. And in terms of our development, we're open source. We are working with a worldwide community of educators, teachers, commercial companies, sovereign nations, and we're all focused towards one goal. We want to deliver the best virtual classroom, and I'll use Moodle here, to empower teachers to improve our world. Thank you. Wow. Okay, uh, we have about five minutes for questions. Does anybody have a, a question for Fred? Thank you for bringing us um, an alternative solution for um, a virtual classroom. But there's still some weak points in the Big Blue Button, because if you want to engage a student, you, you must have um, a really stable audio. And uh, this is um, something you, you cannot uh, master in your, um, in your classroom, because uh, some, 
uh, networks are very unstable. And an another feature that is missing is the ability to export recordings. So is it something that uh, we will see uh, next? All right, so um, the first one, uh, stable audio, video, the network connection, we realize, like, we think the network has come so far. Like Spain is like amazing network from what I've heard, like credible, but that's not the case for everywhere in the world. Um, in many ways, the pandemic forced a lot of uh, universities, colleges to go online. It also forced improvements for some of the networking around the world to get that 463 million have more opportunities. But yes, we're dependent upon the network and maybe there's, I think there's things we can even do better in the future but we're also thinking about what that future would look like. There will be a world coming where you don't ha care about cell bar or bars on your cell phone anymore. You'll just be always connected. And in that world, we want to build the best virtual classroom that anybody, any teacher in the world, any educator could connect with any student in a platform that understands what they're trying to achieve. Um, the second one was, can you have the, the, the recordings as a video? I didn't put it in the slide because there's lots of things we're doing. The next release coming up by the end of the year will give you the recording as a video file. The video board is very exciting, the whiteboard. And, and I guess you've chosen the best that's out there to integrate. Now, when you're using that, I use it all the time with outside th ones like Miro. You're creating knowledge with the students. They're creating, and we've got to use that again later. Is, is that going to be exported, or is that just captured in that one uh, video session, and you just have to take screenshots to remember it? Um, so we'll make it easy for you, actually, to download the entire document with all the whiteboard annotations. This is the version coming this fall. and the you kind of touch on a point where we want to get to a continuous learning environment. I mentioned in the terms of context with Moodle by Matrix, but it, you know, the, the future for us is like, the virtual classroom is your virtual classroom. So imagine, I'll use a physical example. Imagine you're teaching Psychology 101 and the university or college says, that's your classroom. We, we have dedicated that building or that that physical classroom for you. You can put up posters, you come back in, everything's exactly where you left it. If we can get there with the blue button, where you have a continuous classroom where maybe the whiteboard, and the whiteboard marks you did in the last class are there for you as well, along with the chat, along with the shared notes. So that is in the future. So one continuous classroom environment so you can personalize your environment, right? And build relationships with the teachers and students and use that to help learning and teaching. We've been having lots of issues with firewalls using Big Blue Button, um, and I see more people nodding. Any clues, hints, how to solve this? Come talk to me afterwards. Okay. If your server's on the internet, it's good. Uh, if the server's behind a firewall, challenges. If your student's behind a firewall, challenges. But come by and talk to us.